uh, uh, actually, you're chair, chair of the computer. I was for a long time. Not anymore. Okay. <laughs> just, okay. A, just a professor. Just a professor. Okay. Uh, well, he's a, a computer and science and engineering professor, right? Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from Dartmouth in 1982 and his PhD in computer science from Princeton in 1987. Um, he's, you call, what I read was that you co authored over 175 peer reviewed publications. Papers, yeah. Is that, wow, that's yeah. true. That's the terrific. That's a so lot today, of paper. Uh, so, he, so Dan's going to talk to us about, I'm sure uh, artificial intelligence is on everybody's mind. It's on our mind. It's here. We should be, you know, uh, you know, be prepared for it. So I just want to read to you, uh, uh, and I'm sure that Dan will have a diff perhaps a different uh, definition, but artificial intelligence is the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence, such as visual perceptions, speech recognition, decision making, and translation between languages. Now some examples some of, of this is, uh, Alexa that we have, Siri, smart home devices, face recognition, all this is going on. And um, I'm hoping to get an answer as to whether or not AI is a blessing or, <laughs> or a curse. So maybe you can maybe yeah. have that answer to that. Yeah. So uh, we want to welcome, we want to welcome Dan. Well, so this is um, this is a subject I, I really like to talk about. I mean, you can't miss it, of course. It's in the news all the time. But I welcome the opportunity for someone who's a, a little bit of an expert like me. I've been doing this for a while to speak to an audience because there's a lot out there you'll see that sounds too fantastic. It cannot possibly be true, but it actually is true. But there are other things you hear that might be exaggerations or might be not quite right. Because um, everyone is, in some ways, making up stories about AI. <laughs> some of which are based in fact, some of which really aren't. And the question is, what should you be concerned about? What you should you think about? What you should be looking for? What you should be aware of? And hopefully this will help give you a little bit of uh, an understanding of that. Um, I will say right now that, I, you know, we should all, any scientist has concerns about the technology that they might have been involved in helping to create. Um, you might have seen the movie Oppenheimer, for example, right? Um, uh, at the same time, I've got a lot of hope that AI can and will be used for good, for a lot of good things. So we've got to be careful. There's no question about that. But there's a tremendous potential here for um, a big, big jump forward um, for society, for, for humankind um, with AI as well. So, um, so I sort of call this the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you might have seen some of these headlines. These are all headlines over the last you know, a couple months, and I'm sure there's some in the paper today, <laughs> and yesterday, in fact. I keep an eye out for st current stories, and then I use them on my students. I teach the AI class at the time. So, some good things. Um, the AI gym staffed by virtual trainers, right? That's kind of an interesting idea. Robots can make farms more biodiverse with precision crop planning, planting. So, you might know one of the big you know the Industrial Revolution, of course, the one that was in the 1800s, major, major transformational labor? You might be a little less aware of the major revolution in agriculture that took place in the 1930s and 1940s. That was just as disruptive. Millions of farm workers lost their jobs when these really large mechanized farm machines went in and they could do the harvesting and the planting, right? Well, now we're talking about doing it with the precision of a, of a robot, for example. Um, and being able to do farming that much better because the robot has the ability to plant you know, better than any existing machine does and better certainly than humans do as well. Um, this one's computer-aided de uh, detection software. There are a lot of applications in health and healthcare. Actually doing a better job, this is computer vision, looking at medical imagery, doing a better job than human doctors will. They'll find small cancers, they'll find tumors that humans miss because humans make mistakes, right? Um, the best system actually combines the human doctor with the AI, sort of working in tandem, one catching things that the other might miss. But there have been many, many studies that show that AI supplementing human experts in, um, in the field of medicine is a, is a big win. Um, a new AI tool diagnoses brain tumors on the operating table. Now, even the best surgeon in the world can see some things but can't see enough to be able to to do what some of the AI can do with the imaging that it's got available, which go beyond what human eyes can, can do, of course. 
but also do it in very, very real time because of the power of the computers that we've got as well. Um, this is a more of a funny little thing. There was a curator at a museum and basically said when ChatGPT came out, let's let ChatGPT design an exhibit at the museum. Here's the collection that we've got. We've got 10,000 items in our collection and ChatGPT put together an exhibit and describe the items and tell, tell us why you're bringing these items together for an exhibit, right? It was pretty amusing. It did some things that were really quite clever, quite interesting, and sometimes it just got things wrong, which that's what AI has got that capability. Um, uh, AI brings robot wingman to aerial combat. You probably know the military is very interested in using AI. Um, some of our adversaries have made a very big deal that they think AI is the thing they're going to use to beat us. Right? These are statements directly from the leaders of some other countries. Um, but our military as well is applying and uh, employing AI and developing AI too. Um, so there may be a future of what you see in science fiction where you know robots are fighting robots. Um, actually, you, as you've probably been paying attention to the news, that's happening already with these unmanned drones, um, unmanned warships, for example. Those are robots, right? Um, and then um, uh, self-driving cars as well. So I've been around self-driving cars. I, sometimes spend some time out on the West Coast. I tried to get uh, a taxi ride in San Francisco, but there's evidently a very long waiting list right now. You can't quite, oh, I bet. You can't quite do it. But, um, so that's pretty nice to think about, unless you're a taxi driver, right? <laughs> or an Uber or Lyft driver. So that's a concern. All right, <clears throat> the bad. Uh, this is stuff that isn't quite so nice. Um, so some of this technology is so powerful. I don't know if that sounds dangerous, but powerful. It could be misused so badly that the big tech companies are actually withholding it. They're being very, very careful about the way they release it, and as well they should, because it could be used in some very, very bad ways. Um, so ChatGPT and other AI tools, it, I pride myself on being a very good writer. You know, I was trained back in the days, I learned how to type, uh, you know, I learned all the rules for grammar, and I've spent my whole career writing. I'm a great writer. Now there is an AI tool that will allow someone who's a bad writer to become a much better writer. This is much more than grammar checking. It's much more than spell checking. We've had those for a while. This could actually turn someone who's a bad writer into what looks to be a much, much better writer. That concerns me. It turns, allows my students to write wonderful essays. Right? <laughs> it does. So we're all very worried about this in, in education. And how can you tell? Pardon? How can you tell the difference? You can't. Because it is pretty good. Yeah. It's very, very good. So, so until last year, there were some automated tools that could detect plagiarism. So they would actually scour the internet, find you know, massive amounts of text, professionally written text, and then if your student submitted something that was like a direct copy of a paragraph, you could find that, right? That's an amazing task to be able to find that. So that was called Turnitin, and we used that kind of software for you know, maybe a decade or more. Um, as of last year, that simply won't work. There are companies that claim to be able to detect this generated text, but I don't believe it. It's simply not possible. Right? That's how good it is. Um, there are subtle clues, subtle clues you'll be able to pick up. Um, I was just going to. Yeah. Does everybody know what chat be? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You might want to. Uh, I, I've got some. Oh, uh, you're coming. I'll talk a little about chat. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Sorry, yeah. Yep. Um, so college essays, you know written by AI now, written really well by AI, okay? You know the Hollywood writers went on strike? Right. They went on strike because they're concerned that script writing and, all of, and story development will be outsourced to AI. And the fact is AI can write really good scripts, right? It can write really good stories. It could write a pretty good novel. You know, it's not Shakespeare, but it can do a really good job. Um, Zillow, <coughs> one of, I didn't realize that Zillow is not only sort of giving you a way to like look for houses, other places. Some of us sit on our couch and we look at Zillow at you know, warm places that we might want to, like wouldn't it be wonderful at a beach house? Um, but they also were investing where they thought you know, a house was underpriced. They were buying those houses and then trying to flip them. But their AI software that was doing that was doing a bad job. So they lost, I don't think they lost millions, they probably lost hundreds of millions of dollars um, because of that. Um, so AI chatbots can guess your personal information from what you type, right? They're like a psychologist who can get into your head and from a conversation with a chatbot like ChatGPT can actually deduce a lot of things about that. They, I'm guessing, I, don't, I actually don't know this result. They can probably guess your gender, they can probably guess your age, they can probably guess your socioeconomic status.
that might be able to guess your race um, from from having an interaction with them, right? So yes, <laughs> um, stuff you might not want a piece of software to know about you. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Is that part of AI? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. Not only will I be looking on something and it come on an email, but my son's phone and his computer also has a list of the things I was looking at. Yeah, that gets a little bit um, concerning when you see those kinds of connections. It's like, how's it making those Why connections? And you know, there, there are technical ways they can do that. And frankly, some of it, they would argue some of it's good. So if they can send you better ads, by the way, Advertise, advertisers have been pushing ads at us for, for centuries, right? Um, it's just now they can push them more, a lot more accurately. They can fine tune them to the audience. They would argue that you're going to see less annoying ads and more ads that you'll be interested in as a result of this. But when they do things like send things to your son or your, yeah. your relatives based on what you've been looking at, it's like, no, that's crossing the line. Yeah, it's just like that's, crossing yeah. the line. Yeah, especially if it's personal. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, they're, they're, um, there's a famous story about, um, actually by what you look for, what you search for on, on I'm not going to say what website, an online meal teller, I don't remember which one it was. Basically, the AI deducing that you're pregnant, right? Maybe even, you know, before you knew you were pregnant, <laughs> right? Or maybe, you know, somehow your, your parents would find you were pregnant before you told them you were pregnant, something like that, right? So things like that that are very personal. <clears throat> These are some ugly things. So this, you know, this concerns funding in the UK, but female startup founders, female founders, women who found startup companies in AI, were only getting two percent of the funding in the UK. That's sort of the financial ecosystem, which still has a lot of um, bias in it and just, just, uh, discrimination. Um, <laughs> there's a AI. So there's an online tutoring service. You can sort of make money by tutoring people online. But their screening process, if you applied for a tutoring job, would basically rule you out because of your age. Simply because of your age, you're like, no, you're too old to be a tutor. <laughs> right? Stuff like that. That's actually illegal, of course. Yeah. Um, so a woman was hospitalized after a car hit her, a uh, self-driving car hit her. Actually, I think a uh, human hit her. And then, then, then she was hit secondarily by a self-driving <laughs> car, but it's still sort of kind of scary to think about. There have been some accidents, some fatal accidents involving self-driving cars. Um, AI agents that run the internet will one day replace workers. They're actually replacing workers now, right? Um, yeah. So a lot of the jobs that were safe, you know, through automation, now office jobs, sort of jobs that require thinking and sort of writing and, and consuming information are being uh, taken over by artificial intelligence. Um, that's why they, uh, act the, the TV writers were going on strike, right? Um, you probably, this is the funny story. There are lawyers who would actually say, I've got to write a brief for a case, and they would type in the details, and AI would write the, the brief for them, and they would file it in court without checking it. And AI would make up completely fake prior cases, you know, because of the ruling in this case. Because, and, and they weren't cases. They were just totally made up by the AI, right? So you can imagine the judge was pretty annoyed. <laughs> the judge got it. <laughs> and the lawyer was incredibly embarrassed. And the client, I should hopefully would fire the lawyer and say, what are you doing here? Right? Um, that's called hallucination. That's a term that we use when AI makes something up. It sounds very compelling, but it's not true. Um, and then AI chatbots could help plan a bioweapon attacks, right? It's, it's probably true, it probably could do this. So we're concerned about a lot of these things. So AI's got a long history. You might think it's brand new. We've heard a lot about it now in the news the last couple of years, but AI's been around for at least 50 years. It's a serious, with thousands and thousands of people working on it, both from a research and also from a development standpoint. Um, John McCarthy is actually the person who coined the term artificial intelligence. That was in 1956. And he was a professor at, I think, MIT at the time. Actually, the conference was at Dartmouth College, where um, a bunch of people got together in 1956 over the summer. And they said, artificial intelligence. So John McCarthy coined the term. Um, and then he said the aim of AI is to develop machines that beh behave as they were intelligent. <clears throat> That's actually, um, at the time, might have been a good definition. Now it's not so much. We actually have machines that 
they kind of look like they're intelligent, but we wouldn't call them AI. It's just they, they sort of function in a way that it's like, oh, there's some intelligence there. Um, encyclo encyclo back in the old days, there were encyclopedias. Right? <laughs> My students now don't know, really know what they know what Wikipedia is, but they don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, digital computer from past commonly associated with intelligent beings, right? right? But again, you know, a spreadsheet program adding up numbers, you know, we'd say, well, that's what humans add up numbers, spreadsheet adds up numbers. We wouldn't call a spreadsheet AI. Um, this is a definition by Elaine Rich, and this one's probably a better definition. It's basically AI is always the thing you can't do, <laughs> right? Um, it, so it sort of always keeps it in the future. So it's how to make computers mm -hmm. do things that right now, humans are better at doing, right? And until the last couple of years, there were a lot of things that fell in that category. Humans were better at lots and lots and lots of stuff. Now, it's getting much, much tighter, the, the set of things that we're better at than computers. Um, it's, it's almost to the point where, before I would say, oh, I would rattle off a list. We're better at doing this, we're doing this, doing this, driving cars, right? Recognizing an image, scenes in an image, if you give me a photograph, understanding a video, writing a funny story. I would say we are better at all these things. Now AI has gotten better than us at many of those things. <clears throat> all right, so and just some things you might have been aware of. So some of the interesting highlights in the history of AI that became very public. Um, Gary Kasparov, some of you might know, back, back in the day was the that. world chess champion. Then he was beaten by a computer in 19, a supercomputer in 1997, an IBM computer. It was the first time you know a computer beat the best human chess player. The year before, Kasparov actually won and beat, beat the computer. The computer got better, and he didn't. That's the way these things work. The computer gets better, faster, more memory. Humans, we don't progress as fast, right? So that's why our heads are starting to spin a little bit right now. Um, and to that, so, so in, a lot of people didn't find that so surprising because chess is kind of a mathematical game, so it makes sense that computers could do it well, right? This was more surprising in 2011 because Jeopardy is like a game for brainiacs. It's a word game. It's language. It's knowledge of the world. So the fact that IBM Watson not just beat the best human Jeopardy players, it destroyed the best human Jeopardy players. I mean, there was no contest. It was just amazing. Like that was just a, a big jump forward for artificial intelligence, winning this game that we didn't think AI would win for a very long time. <coughs> You might know Go. Go is an ancient Chinese game. It's actually kind of like chess, but it's in some ways more complicated. It's more simple, but it's more complicated. Yeah. AI beat the best human Go player in 2016. That was a Google AI. And very soon we'll have self-driving cars. Actually, we do have self-driving cars, but you'll be probably seeing them, maybe even sitting in them uh, sometime quite soon. I want to say just one word about um, some of what makes AI powerful. A lot of techniques here, you've heard of generative AI, I'll say a couple words about generative AI in, in a minute. Um, most of this is based on collecting huge amounts of data, right, which we can do now better than we could do 10 years ago, 20 years ago. If you think about it, if you've got a smartphone, the amount of data that it's collecting. Um, I'm instrumented with <clears throat> a watch that collects health data, right, with a ring that collects health data, even when I sleep, which is really quite cool. And then all of this goes into apps on my, my phone, and I've, got, and, and I've got a scale at home that's a smart scale that weighs me, I've got a blood pressure, I gotta do all this stuff because I've gotten to the age and the doctor says, you gotta keep track of these things. It's all going into here, right? The amount of data I'm collecting is unbelievable. And no, some no of glasses sure yet? <laughs> Pardon? No glasses yet? Uh, you could do that too, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah there, there are sort of smart glasses that will help assist, you know, be useful in some ways too. Um, so, so that's the amount of data, the algorithms, you know, the mathematical methods we developed to process the data, the power of the computers that we're using, the storage, the networking. Back in the old days, you used to have to plug a computer into a network, right? But now it's like everywhere, right? Wireless networking. Um, one of these techniques is called reinforcement learning. And it's based on what happens with people, which is, you know, a little kid, they go out, they try something. You know, if it works good for the little kid, they'll do it again. If it was fun, if they burn themselves, well, they've learned, right? They learn from the negative experience. So that's reinforcement learning. And that's how some of these techniques, that's how some of those game techniques become so good because the computer plays against itself, right? And that's how it gets better. So the computer is an opponent against itself. 
Schumann can play, you know, 10 chess games a day, maybe get a bit better. A computer can probably play 10 million chess games a day against another computer and get better that way. And the technique is called reinforcement learning. <clears throat> so this is a, looks like you have to work. This is an animation. So this little stick figure is learning how to walk. It's not programmed. It doesn't get programmed how to walk. That would be kind of hard to program. But it's learning how to walk. And its goal is to move as quickly as it can, to control its joints so it moves as quickly and efficiently as it can. And it repeats this learning over and over again. And you're going to see it starts out very awkwardly. You can might imagine that it starts the way um, a child would walk, uh, it starts to learn how to walk. Um, it's very awkward, doesn't get very far, but eventually it gets better and better and better. So this is after 160, doing pretty good. 320 training cycles. Now it sort of knows to sort of do this and walk, right? 640, it's getting better and better and better, right? And it's very much, it's actually walking like a person would walk. It was not programmed to walk the way a person would. It, it just learned, learned that. It, it learned, learned that. that. That's right. It learned that, right? It's, it's still got a little bit of a hitch there, right? It doesn't have as many joints as we do. I was going to say, look at Well, it's got arms. Right. It's moving like, oh. Where's the problem? Yeah. And then a, a little spider, which, you know, the spider's got to learn how to move its legs, right? <laughs> So the same same thing with the spider, learning how to move efficiently. It's learning this. It's not programmed. It is learning how to do this. Um, there's another one I've got here. <coughs> Let's go. This is a robot that is using a kid's puzzle. That's a wooden puzzle that's got wooden shapes like yeah. stars and circles, and it's got to stick the shape in the right place. So it's doing the same thing. It's doing reinforcement learning. The idea is to get it in as quickly and as smoothly as possible. It didn't know anything about this puzzle to start with. It's learning it entirely by doing it and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. So this is how these programs become so powerful. Is one of the techniques is reinforcement learning. I'm just about to lecture my class on this topic next week. <laughs> it's a topic that's in my head. Isn't there. there a movie about where Russia and the United States they were ex exchanging missiles? Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. Just it's called, called, this is a really old movie. Most people might not know it. My students wouldn't know. It's called Colossus the Forbin Project. Uh, I'm mm. not sure. Is that it? Uh, is that yeah. what it is? Yeah. Well, games. there's also War Games. War there's War Games, games and Colossus. Yeah. So one's got so, Matthew Broderick in it. So. Yeah, Matthew Broderick. <laughs> oh, that's War Games. That's War Games. Yeah, yeah but that's, that's War games. they called it the Whopper. The, the yeah, yeah. It was yeah, called yeah, the Whopper. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, War Games. Yeah. That's a, that's a good old movie. And so it's, that's more well known than. Um, that had uh, Matthew Broderick and Ali yeah. Sheedy in it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I like that movie. Colossus is a little bit more of a, a downer movie. <laughs> That's the Russian computer and the American computer getting together and conspiring against the humans. Right. right. I know, just think about that. <laughs> um, I thought he was going to say getting together and making okay. little yeah. computers. So we'll, we'll, we'll move on. All right. So um, I mentioned that AI has been around for at least 50 years. So in, in 1950. Alan Turing, many of you might know who Turing is, um, uh, wrote a brilliant, brilliant mathematician. He also helped solve, uh, help win World War II. He was a British mathematician who helped break the Nazi codes, right? This group of mathematicians in, 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 in Great Britain um, helped break the Nazi codes. So he's sort of well known for that, but also maybe as the father of computing, at least yeah. the mathematical side. So he made up this test for. Um, when a machine is intelligent. So this is 1950. There were probably five computers in the entire world. And he wrote this paper. It's actually in um, a psychology journal or a philosophy journal, right? And he said, the very first line, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? He wrote that in 1950. He was unbelievably brilliant. So if you read the paper, you'll sort of read how he thought this through really, really well at a time when computers really couldn't do anything. Um, but he was looking into the future. He even made predictions that were accurate, like going out 50 years. He said, basically, in about 50 years, computers will be powerful enough. I don't know how he made these estimates, because we didn't have transistors. We didn't have the huge, you know, powerful computers we had. We had nothing back in the 1950s. So um, and the test he designed was called the imitation game, which was put a computer in one room, put a human in another room, use like a keyboard for communication, like texting, and have a human judge sit outside and ask questions. And if the human judge can say with certainty, the computer's over there, the human's over there, then the computer fails. 
the Turing test. But if the human judge is only right half the time, random chance, then the computer's won, right? The computer looks enough like a human, it's just a random guess. So he called it the imitation game, we call it the Turing test. There was a movie you might have seen <laughs> about Turing's yeah. exploits during World War II. The, the movie was called The Imitation Game, but it had nothing to do with the imitation game. It had to do with breaking the codes, the Nazi codes in World War II. Only at the very end did they briefly mention, mention this. All right, so ChatGPT. So you've heard about ChatGPT. Um, you can use it for free you can sign up for it. You, can buy it. you might want to have some fun with ChatGPT. Um, you can also get it via Microsoft, because Microsoft uh, has a big investment in, in the company that did ChatGPT. So I asked, you can't see this, but I'm going to share my slides um, afterwards, so you'll yeah. have my slides. Yeah, but we'll get your slides. I asked the question, why would someone want to live in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania? I just asked that. And ChatGPT came up with, people may choose to live in Bethlehem for a variety of reasons. It's a city with a rich history and a diverse cultural offerings, and it's got historical and cultural significance. It mentions um, historic charm, the historic Moravian district, um, the Chris Kindle Mar market, um, right? Inspired by European traditions. And then it says education opportunities, it's home to uh, educational institutions, including Lehigh and Moravian, um, job opportunities. It mentions Bethlehem Steel. It says Bethlehem Steel's gone, but, but the economy is diversified. It knows all about our area, right? And this is what, like, you know, the Chamber of Commerce might hand out and say, this is what you want to live in Bethlehem. <laughs> Very well written. Okay, quality of life, um, relatively low cost of living, well, <laughs> maybe compared to some other places. Um, attractive for those, um, a more affordable lifestyle. It's got a vibrant art scene, parks, and recreational activities. Yeah, I know. So I could type the same thing in Google and get a very similar response. What's the difference between chat, GBT, and Google? So Google, no, so Google's traditional search would return a whole bunch of hits. and. You would only get a response like that if someone had written, a human had written that before, and Google brought that up for you, right? So, so there are probably, there, I don't believe there's any website, and you can check me on this, that is exactly the same summary of why should I live in that line, right? So it's, it's synthesizing information together and then presenting it back to you very coherently. But you could, if you poke around with Google enough, there are questions you can ask Google that it'll give you like web pages that will answer the question, right. but it won't directly answer the question. So that's what ChatGPT. Uh, what about the trust? How do you trust this? No, so we'll, <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. a good point, right? Um, I'll get to that in a second. Okay, but, sir. Um, uh, what's the best way to go from Bethlehem to Allentown? <laughs> I actually asked this, right? I said, what is the best way to go from, I didn't take out a map and sort of look at the map. I do use maps all the time, I use Google Maps all the time. What is the best way to go from Bethlehem to Allentown? Well, if a friend asked you, how would you answer that question? Driving. Well, you could go, if you had a vehicle, you could drive. Get on 22 West, which is exactly what I did, right? Um, or you could use public transportation. And it was about Lanta. It says you could take Lanta to go from Bethlehem. And then it says you could also um, bicycle. Um, there are trails that would get you from Bethlehem to Allentown as well. It knows these things, right? And it's actually explaining this the way a really good, really smart friend would explain to you, right? So. Am I the first person to ever ask that question? Probably, of ChatGPT, right? And still, it came up with an answer like that. Um, I said, what's the most delicious dessert that you know of? This is where it gets interesting. This is where you can start telling it's an AI. Subjective. Okay. What's the del most delicious? Now, if you ask that of a, of a person, cheesecake. they would say, cheesecake, I love this, I love <laughs> ice cream sundaes, right? ChatGPT says, um, it's, it's very diplomatic. <laughs> so it says, okay, well, there's chocolate cake, there's cheesecake, there's apple pie, there's tiramisu, there's ice cream, creme brulee, baklava, and it describes each one the mochi, which is Japanese, um, gulab jamun, which is Indian, and churros, which is uh, uh, Spanish or Mexican. <laughs> so it's, it has one for sort of every possible, you know, geographic region of the world. Um, it doesn't want to offend anyone by saying that ice cream sundae is better than churros or something like that. So that's where you can tell, okay, that's kind of an AI. It's not, not the person I'm, I'm talking to. Um, oh, this was a good one. Can you catch a train from New NYC? Can you catch a train from NYC to Paris? <laughs> and you know what? It, no. I think it can. I no. no, no. You cannot catch a train from New York City. By the way, I didn't type New York City. It knew New York City. There's no direct train route 
primarily because they're separated by the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> so it's yeah, like use Google uh, Maps yeah. now still. It tells you to swim. Yeah, <laughs> you could. It actually says you should go to JFK or Newark and fly to De Gaulle. So it's like, yeah, it's really smart. Um, does Chat GPT does it use Google to pull all the information together? Um, it uses a different search engine, so it's sort of a competitor. Google is starting to do the same thing, right? They need their AI to sort of compete with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is by a company called OpenAI, and they get a lot of their funding from Microsoft, and you might know that Microsoft and Google are yeah. kind of like yeah. <laughs> opponents, yeah. competitors. So is so. the Chinese involved with any of this, like TikTok or? They are probably doing things very much along these lines and paying attention as well, for sure. Yeah, you can assume that, that these techniques, the 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 research behind this, the ideas behind this, are broadly known, even though the companies do have tremendous intellectual property mm -hmm. that they protect, right? And the thing about this is the data, what makes this powerful is the data that's freely available on the, on the World Wide Web, right? That's why these AIs are getting so smart, because all the data that, and this is why people are angry about it, so this is why like the New York Times is suing ChatGPT, is because these big, um, AI, generative AI systems are sucking up data that we all put online. If you're a reporter and wrote stories for the New York Times for 30 years, those stories are being sucked up. Now, they're not gonna be repeated exactly back, but ChatGPT uses it to become smarter, right? So it's like we put this stuff out there, we all freely put this stuff out there on the, on the web to help inform other people, right? We'd like to see people get smarter, and now the machines are using it, that's what's happening. Interesting. Yeah. So it's really interesting to think about. When was the last time the Phillies won the World Series? Right? It's like a totally natural language question. By the way, Google did, used to be really bad at questions like this, right? But Google's gotten a little bit better with natural language questions. Now, I asked this um, last year, and as of last year, ChatGPT famously only was programmed up through September of 2021. Uh. And the first thing it says is, I only know stuff up until September 2021. I think they've actually fixed that. Now, the newest, newer versions now don't have that limit. So it says, but as of September 2021, they won their most recent World Series in 2008. They beat the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. This, and this is, this is true. This is totally true, right? Um, so that's pretty cool. And it knows what it doesn't know, right? Which isn't always the case. <laughs> um, this is a question. So some of you might know the answer. Is Lehigh University older than Lafayette College? Anyway, yeah, answer I, I, I think it's older. Lehigh's older. Older, yeah. I would, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so Lafayette was founded in I think 1826. So Lafayette, Marquis Lafayette, was still alive at that point. Mm -hmm. And he toured around the US. He was okay, got 50 year after 1776 victory tour, basically. Um, so he was he was a fairly young man during the revolution, right? So Lafayette was founded. I don't know if it was founded when he was still alive, but very close to the time that Lafayette was still alive. Lehigh was founded after the Civil War in 1865. So Lehigh's, you know, whatever, 40 years younger, younger than Lafayette. Yeah, yeah, right? than Lafayette. <clears throat> anyway, wow. so the, <laughs> I said, is Lehigh University older than Lafayette College? Yes, Lehigh University is older than Lafayette College. Wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> then it said, Lehigh, located in Bethlehem, was founded in 1865. Correct. Lafayette, located in Eastern, was founded in 1826. <laughs> so, so it doesn't really know what it's saying, yeah. right? So it doesn't know what wrong. older means, right? Yeah. So, and it said Lafayette has been in existence several decades longer than Lehigh. So everything there is correct, yeah. except when it agreed with me, well, it seemed to agree with me, it says Lehigh's older than Lafayette, right? Yeah. So it's like, what's going on there? That's why you can't really totally trust it, because yeah, it'll come out with things it. that make no sense at all. Mm -hmm. Um, if you've got logic, right? Is there anything you're not sure about? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then it said, um, there's, there's several things I'm not sure. It's very modest. There are a couple things I'm not sure about, right? Um, so it, it, again, it says September 2021. Um, may not have detailed information about highly specialized or obscure topics. Um, so if there's something recent or highly specialized, I won't know what it is. It probably has a better response now than when I, when I tried this a while ago. All right, so there, that's um, language-based generative AI. Then there's also image-based generative AI. So you can ask AI to generate an image for you, right? And this is where it gets kind of fun. Probably if you've got 
you know, kids or grandkids or, or, or younger um, relatives, they're probably having a lot of fun playing around, generating images with AI, right? Um, and this can get nasty too, because you can generate, there was something about Taylor Swift mm -hmm. a few Swifties. weeks ago. Any Swifties like, here? Yeah, so it's like, yeah, you can do bad things as well. Um, I asked for a cake made from banana popcorns and gummy bears, and this is what I got. It's mm -hmm. very photorealistic. It doesn't look like a cake I, I, I would eat. <laughs> <laughs> It's got some popcorn. It's got um, I don't know, almost like a corn kernels that have been chopped up. Um, the gummy bears seem to be growing out of the corn, which I didn't ask it to do, but you know, it's like it's yeah, very it's creative. Yeah. Um, all right. This one I said: <coughs> five dogs wearing clothing and playing poker around a table. You probably know there's some yeah. very famous Victorian mm -hmm. kitschy paintings of dogs playing poker. That's kind of what I wanted. Um, I said five dogs wearing clothing, playing poker around a table. This is what it gave me. Uh, right? three. Now there are only three dogs, they're not five. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to say whether they're playing poker or not, but it got the right idea, yeah. right? It yeah, looks kind of a little Victorian as well. So, yeah. And it's photorealistic, of course. This isn't like those paintings are obviously paintings. This is photorealistic, so it's not clear it's where it's painted. Right? You know, it's, yeah, it's not a painting. No, it's not. It's, 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 it looks quite good. The lighting is a little bit strange. This is the one that sort of Again, freaked me out a bit. Because I'm worried about misinformation and disinformation and AI. You hear a lot about this now, especially with the election. Yeah. So I asked for George Washington playing basketball. Now, basketball was invented in Springfield, Massachusetts, 1870s, I think. So that was about 70 years after Washington died. He never played basketball, right? Uh, but, I don't know, Professor. But this image here. There he is. Not just looks like one. Now, the only thing weird is there are two basketballs there. The yeah, AI will do things like that sometimes. <laughs> but even the background with the pick, white picket fence, yeah. it looks very colonial. <laughs> so, and, and, and honestly, yeah, that looks like a photograph of George Washington playing basketball. Right, so we have to be very worried about what we see because it's very, very, and this was generated in a fraction of a second, a minute. <laughs> It might have taken 10 seconds to generate this image. I could never done this with Photoshop, but AI did that very quickly. Wow. All right, so just a, a word of, about generative AI. You'll hear a lot, that's generative AI. ChatGPT is generative AI. Those image generators are generative AI. This is what the Hollywood writers are worried about as well, generative AI. Um, songwriters are worried about it too, right? Um, the copyright and patent, patent office are very interested in this, this topic when AI starts to generate um, journals have said that AI cannot be a co-author on a paper. They actually had to say that. <laughs> AI cannot be a co-author. <laughs> right? um, so it, it's very similar to um, reinforcement learning. So there are two entities here. There are two AIs. One is the teacher and one is the student. right? Or we might say the generator, that's the student. And teacher is the discriminator. And the generator tries to generate fake images that fool teacher, the fool, the discriminator. And the discriminator tries to say, that's real, that's real, that's fake, that's fake, very, very reliably. And they play this game against each other and so keep playing it until the student gets so good that the student is generating amazing looking images that are hard to tell from real. Okay, and they can do this millions of times a day, like I said, because computers are incredibly fast. So that's what generative AI is. And um, these are using deep neural networks, you've heard about that, these are uh, mathematical models that are similar to the human brain. They're gigantic models. They take a lot of computer cycles. We could probably fill this room with computers um, to run some of these models. You sometimes see these big warehouses filled with computers um, mm -hmm. that are being used to develop these kinds of AIs. And Google and, and Microsoft and Amazon um, all have these big systems that, that do this. Um, so one of these is generating fake images and the other is trying to say that's fake or that's real. Is, is it all based on like an, an if-then algorithm? Just billions, bazillions of them? Well, it's, it's a lot more sophisticated than that. So it's based on mathemat mathematical models of the human brain that are called neural networks. Mm -hmm. And some of that work went back even to the 1930s. So we started to understand the electrical functioning of the brain, the way the synapses work. So, but then they were carried forward and now they're digital. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Thank um, you. So yeah. it's, it's much more, in some sense, it, each of these little units is very simple. It takes electrical impulses in, and if it reaches a certain threshold, it fires an electrical impulse out. This is what the neurons in your brain do. Mm -hmm. And this is what these mathematical neurons do as well. 
but there are billions and billions of them. Your, your brain's got trillions of them, but these computer models are approaching the brain in terms of their power and, and their ability to store and to run these algorithms. But, but, it's, but, it's, but, it's, but doesn't it still all come back to if this, then that? Um, it's so so. It's a lot more sophisticated than well, that. Well, if this, 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 then yeah. that, 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 So that. so one of the things that, one of the things that Turing did, Alan Turing, is he had a mathematical model for the computer. It's a really simple mathematical model, and even though he developed this in the 1930s, it still describes the way all computers work. Now it's not the most efficient way to build a computer, but mathematically it basically describes all computers. So in that sense. It could all boil down to some very simple instructions like if then, but that's not the way we would build it now. That would be very inefficient to build it that way. Um, all right, so generative AI um, is one of these techniques, and it can generate images, it can generate text. Um, and again, it's the, the discriminator is the teacher, the generator is the student. Um, there are going to be um, some real images to get thrown to the discriminator and some fake ones. The discriminator's got to say real, fake reliably and the student is trying to do a better and better job generating fake images. So that's the way these things are working. Teacher and generator, teacher and student I would say. Um, it also works for text as well. So ChatGPT is one of these models that's been trained on huge amounts of text. Also um, some of the more advanced GPTs are trained on images as well, trained on speech. So what's being done with text can be done with images, you saw that can be done with speech. Um, structured data as well. Um, like medical records and things like that that have structure to them. And then they're used to create what's called the foundation model. So this is like a gigantic brain that can do anything. And then that brain gets specialized. So if I was a company and I wanted to build a public, you know, like a, a pub, uh, sort of a customer service chat, and let's say I was a travel company, I was an airline, I would specialize this foundation model to understand what my customer, airline customers care about and then it would be an amazing customer service agent, totally AI, to deal with my customers, right? Develop from this, what's called a foundation model. So that's what ChatGPT is. So as you can imagine, this Turing test, we talked about the Turing test that Turing developed, saying, you know, put the computer in a room and a human in a room, ask them questions and tell which is which. Basically, ChatGPT broke the Turing test, right? Uh, we no longer can talk about the Turing test anymore because computers have won that one. Just like they won chess, they won um, Jeopardy. Um, so here's something that was in the New York Times literally like last week. And some of you might have seen this. This is like amazing. So images, okay. Generating text, okay. This is generating video. Mm -hmm. So the prompt, you can see the entire prompt. This is what the New York Times told this generator. Um, OpenAI, the same company as the ChatGPT. So one of the video, short video, several giant woolly mammoths approach treading towards a snowy meadow. It's very descriptive, right? Snow-covered trees, snow-capped mountains, um, afternoon light, wispy clouds. That's all it gave it. It just said, do that, take this and generate a short video. Mm -hmm. And this is the video. I'm going to play the video for you. This is actually in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. Look at that. That was generated <sighs> entirely by AI, entirely by AI. No human involvement with the videos, Look at that. It's and it's almost insanely awesome. good. All right, yeah. um, it could be like National Geographic if we had more. Right? I mean, how, how would you? There's almost no way to tell, right? Sorry. Almost no way to tell. The shadows look good. Um, <coughs> the the clouds are yeah. I'm so confused. Is this computer an entity on itself? Or is human beings throwing in all this information? Did somebody type up how you get from Bethlehem to Allentown? Yeah. Well, so somewhere on the internet, all this information exists. Is what? It exists. It all exists on the internet. So because can, somebody put it in the machine. No, no, it, 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 See, it, it sort of it captured it automatically. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, Originally, yes, somebody put it in, but not to address that issue. Right. So somewhere it's like on the search the, engine, but it just reads everything from the internet. Well, it but, but, but it's also it's also it's synthesized. Typed it in in the first place originally. Yeah. So, but 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 it, the thing about the generative AI, it's not just sort of grabbing something and copying it for you. It's synthesizing new things. 
So that's how it's, it's different. So if it was just grabbing something and copying this paragraph and giving you the same paragraph someone wrote, that would not be interesting. What's interesting is it's synthesizing completely new ideas, completely new text, completely new images, completely new videos. No one ever had this video on the internet. The AI generated this video, right? Um, it could be, um, this generative AI could be making suggestions for new drugs to test to treat cancer. The AI could read the entire medical literature and say, I see some connections here that humans haven't seen. I'm gonna make this just suggestion for the following experiments, right? It could do something like that. So but that's- the, but, Excuse me, but the information, the, the actual uh, information is being synthesized, processed, is, so- Yeah. The, the synthesis is, is like the smartest person you've ever known knowing every single piece of information in the entire world. <laughs> right, that's basically what it's doing. So in some sense, we could <clears throat> trace somehow, we could maybe somehow trace this back. We're not gonna find a picture of that mammoth, we're not gonna find that scene, we're not gonna find those, we're not gonna find, any, find of that. any of that. You won't find any of that on the internet? No, you, no, no. no. So no. That, no. that got generated, that, you know, you know, like that, that yeah. image, yeah. that video. Yeah, it was totally, totally generated, totally synthetic, um, and incredibly good looking, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's not taking simple copy and paste or cut and paste, it's not doing that, it's way, way beyond that, which is which really quite, quite, quite cool. All right, so Stephen Hawking, the, the, the brilliant physicist, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, Stephen Hawking. made a comment about the dangers of AI, and it's not that AI is gonna become evil and kill us. You know, some people are worried about evil AI is gonna kill us. He said AI is going to become so good that its interests and our interests are not aligned, but it, AI will be so good at what it's doing, it doesn't matter. It's just going to sort of run over us, right? So that's the thing that we, we might need to worry about, right? Not that it's going to be evil, but it will become so good and so capable of what it's doing, not just will become irrelevant. In some cases, we might be in a little bit of danger. We might be in danger, right? So that's something to think about. So very danger. And then, um, well, this is stuff that AI, you know, what can AI do, what can AI not do? Um, play a decent game of Jeopardy, we know that. Beat humans at chess, yep. Beat humans at go, yes. Play tennis, can AI play tennis? Yes, play a good game of tennis, yep. Um, grab a particular cup and put it on a shelf, yes. The robots that can do that. Unload any dishwasher in any home. Not quite yet, right? <laughs> Um, we have a little robot that goes around and vacuums our floor, yeah. <laughs> and we've got neighbors who have one that actually mows the lawn. No, they vacuum the lawn. So, clean the pool. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't think Rosie today could do that? Pardon? You don't think Rosie today could do that? Rosie the robot. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's a vision looking to the future yeah. for sure. Yeah, we're getting some of yeah. that now. So I'm, I'm sure somebody's programmed a Rosie to yeah. unload a dishwasher. Yeah, the trouble is any dishwasher in any home, there's a lot of variation and variety, right? So that's the thing that we're good at still, is the huge variation and variety where every once in a while, you know, computers, even though they've got this tremendous AI, will mess up. So there was a, a, a very tragic accident um, with a, when a, 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 I think it was a Tesla, self-driving, in self-driving mode, hit a pedestrian and killed her. And what happened was the pedestrian was crossing in the middle of the street, so she was jaywalking, mm. and she was pushing a bike. So the bike was going like this way, right across the street. The AI was programmed, you know, to obviously look for people, to look for cars, look for obstructions, but probably not programmed for the idea of a, of a vehicle, in this case a bike, moving sideways like that, right? The bike being walked across the street. So if you look at the, with the AI, the computer vision was seeing in the car, it was very confused about what it was seeing. It sort of identified it as a this, and then it was this, it was a car, no, it's not a car, it's a person, it's not a person. It was confused, right? So our, the robustness of our intellect, our, our vision, um, our senses is still better than the robustness of AI. We're able to handle many more challenging situations. If it's rainy, if it's dark, if it's foggy, we can recognize those situations better than, than what AI can do right now. Um, that's our one big advantage at this point. <laughs> okay, this question. In giant stores, there's a robot that yes. runs. What's the purpose of that robot? It's always in my way. Yeah, I, I don't know. It gets in my way, too. <laughs> they're, they're, they're tracking. He's tracking, uh, mapping the store 
and he's uh, informing the staff that there are spills. Yeah, it, I've heard it say that. It identifies spills and hazards, which other than that does get in the way. <laughs> um, drive safely on the highway, yes. Um, actually, um, autonomous vehicles are safer on the highway than humans are. On the highway, right? A lot on the highway. There, yes, on the highway. So there are um, millions of truck drivers who will be losing their jobs because yeah, it's cheaper, it's much, much safer, it doesn't fall asleep, <laughs> right? It doesn't get distracted by a cell phone. AI is much, much safer, um, despite the well-publicized accidents. Uh, drive safely along a busy road, like if you've been on Packer Avenue when classes are changing, the students are jaywalking and you know, all that. No, no, that's still a challenging task for AI. Um, Buy a week's worth of groceries on the web, yeah. like stock yeah. your, yeah, yeah for I you, do yeah. I do that. Yeah. Well, the AI could do it. It could actually learn what you want, what you need, what you're out yeah, of. Yeah, it gives me the yeah. purchasing history and, you know, yeah. have you forgotten anything? Yeah, and there are even some refrigerators now that know what's in your refrigerator. They yeah. sort of keep track of what's in your refrigerator. Uh, buy a week's worth of groceries at Wawa, probably not, right? Because every Wawa is a bit different the way it's laid out. Discover and prove a new mathematical theorem. I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't happening right now. Yeah, so basically um, taking what mathematicians with the province of humans, very smart humans, and taking that over. Perform a surgical operation. So you've heard about robotic surgery. It's actually more like being used as a, a, a tool, like, like another scalpel. At this point it's assisting, but it's not actually doing the surgery. But at some point, it will probably be the case that robots will be performing at least part of the yeah. surgery as well. I thought they weren't doing the surgery because I've seen, my doctor told me this, that he was in his office doing the surgery, but the robot was doing it for him. Well, but so they're, control, assisting, they're controlling right? it. It's like the doctor was, but the doctor was doing it. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's like it's got a very fine um, arm. To tiny little fingers. Tiny little fingers. And you're controlling the fingers, but you're sort of saying, move here, move here, right. right? So it takes your big, chunky hands and makes them small so you can do the surgery better. So that's kind of a tool as opposed to being the robot seeing and doing the surgery, but that'll, that'll happen soon. Um, translate spoken Chinese into spoken English in real time. Um, yes, that can be done. Um, military's got this technology. I've, you might have it on your phone. I've got Google Translate, and I was in Japan, and I was pointing at it like menus. And it was translating the menus for me in real time. That was quite sure tricky for me. Yeah. Um, and then write an intentionally funny story. <laughs> now, it used to be AI could not do this. So this slide was made about two or three years ago at Berkeley, which is one of the leading places in AI. They said no. But now, ChatGPT can write an intentionally funny story. So I said, write me a funny story about a cat, a dog, and a squirrel who become friends in the, in the town of Katsakwa, right? And it wrote me this story, and you can't read it, but I'll give it to Scott. This is the story that it wrote. And it's uh, once upon a time in the quaint town of Katasakwa, there resided a cat named Mittens, a dog named Duke, and a squirrel named Scurry. Katasakwa is known for its charming streets lined with old fashioned lampposts and cozy little houses with colorful gardens. Mittens, a fluffy white Persian cat with an air of sophistication, spent her days lounging on windowsills, occasionally gracing the townsfolk with a regal nod as they passed by. Duke, a scrappy yet lovable mutt, bounded through the streets with boundless energy, his tail wagging furiously as he greeted everyone he met. Scurry, a mischievous squirrel with a pension for mischief, mischievous with a pension for mischief, scurried about the trees and rooftops, always on the lookout for his next adventure. So, and then it's a nice little story to be like a, a, a child story, but it, that was synthesized by ChatGPT. Actually, this morning I did it this morning. So yes, you can write funny stories, you can write amusing stories, you can write movie it's, scripts. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, it could just give you yeah. literature. I mean, it's just yeah. a, like, a, like a podcast. How long does it take to come back with that? Oh, a fraction of a second. Wow. It's very, very quick. Yep. Um, so AI, you might hope, and absolute. I might be able to take it a little while, but you've been great asking questions, so hopefully that's okay. Um, reduce needless traffic deaths and injuries. There's far too many of those. And despite the very well-publicized accidents, AI is much safer than humans driving. Um, improving working conditions across all types of jobs so that we don't have to do the things that are bad for us physically or bad for us mentally because AI will be able to take over a lot of those jobs. There are going to be some upheaval and some challenges, right? Um, just like there were in the Industrial Revolution and the Agricultural Revolution. Um, dramatically improve health care and lower costs. Can we just stop there? For, so, yeah. so if I'm in the hospital or if I'm in rehab, we, we, could, we could have a robot yeah. come into my 
Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. You know, uh, room. my room, pick up the towels, clean oh, yeah. it, you know, uh, adjust my bed, uh, you know. Yeah, you, 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 may not people, you may know people who, may, who really shouldn't be living alone, right? They have no alternative or, you know, um, yeah. so there will be robots that will be your assistant that, that, that will take care of the fact that when you're living alone, there's dangers for, uh, for some people to be living alone, right, on their own. Um, Japan is very har- far ahead in, in this regard. A lot of developments in robotics, even from, from the 60s and the 70s, Japan was very far ahead. Um, they've got a society, you probably know, that their birth rate is below their death rate, so they're shrinking. So they have an aging society in Japan, and there's a very big concern, tradition of Caregiving. children taking care of the parents, right? But at this point now, there's not even that ability or that potential anymore, so they're thinking about robots to take over some of these responsibilities. Um, we'll have it too, I think, as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of potential there, I think, and, and many good things. In the yeah. Um, healthcare, uh, lots of things in healthcare. Um, you know, there, there are things that can be kept track of on your phone, like you should not mix these two medicines together, um, or you took this and now I'm getting a, a, a strange reading on, on, you know, this thing is taking my pulse um, regularly. This measures my yeah. my blood oxygen you know, right. regularly, right? Um, and help me with that. Um, the quality of education, you know, can now be specialized to each individual student, right? So they can be taught in the way that it is. A great teacher can do that, but if you've got 40 students in your classroom, you can't give specialized attention to each one of them all the time. Right. AI can do that, right? Or help a teacher do that. Um, accelerate scientific discoveries, as I mentioned this idea. AI could read the entire literature for a certain field and then make suggestions about new ideas, right? Um, create new ways of business, business innovation, um, security and safety and security, monitoring things that need to be monitored. Um, you know, that we aren't able to catch, so we don't get caught by surprise. It happens sometimes. Um, and then um, address big challenges like climate change, solutions there as well, and improve quality of life. This is the best case scenario. Uh, on the other hand, we could end up with systems that are, you know, very, very profitable for the company that fields the system, but not great for us, you know, just taking advantage of us as some kind of resource um, to be fleeced for, for money. <laughs> um, Privacy is a concern because of all it is being collected about us. Um, you need to try to be careful. It's very hard to be completely disconnected from this data collection activity. Can I um, ask you so, a question about that? Yep. Alexa, is that by the intelligence? Alexa uses that? Yeah. Oh. Alexa. Alexa. Yeah. Alexa is using speech recognition and speech synthesis, which are significant AI applications. Yeah. Some people don't like Alexa. They say the government is listening to us. Is that possible? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 is it technically possible? It is technically possible, right? You've got a microphone in your home, and that microphone could be on hearing things. Um, you know, I, I will say that if there was some rogue engineer doing that, they would be fired in a fraction of a second for doing that. And the company would get in a lot of trouble if it was found out they were doing those kinds of things, right? So they're very, they take that very seriously. But technically, yes, it is feasible. So if you're very concerned about that kind of surveillance, um, we do. I actually don't use her for anything. My wife, I can't, we ask her like, what the weather's going to be. <laughs> so we're using. We've got this expensive technology. We're saying, what's the weather tomorrow going to be? Because she's annoying. My dog barks, and she has to tell me that my dog's barking. Is that right? Well, that's kind of funny, though. <laughs> Do phones have artificial Yes. Yeah. yeah, some of the apps in your phone are certainly making use of that. Absolutely. Well, when you said about privacy, I had a summer helper, and he came up to me, and he goes, Mr. Gillespie, i got to tell you something, because i got to go see my probation. Okay. And I want to explain why I have to go see my probation. So he went to school, and there was a new kid in school. And as a joke, the kid was going to the bathroom, so we took a picture of him from behind going to the bathroom. Oh. Very innocent. Within one hour, the police were in school, and he was kicked out. Yeah. Like, and I didn't realize how quick that, within one hour yeah. of posting that picture. I suspect that because he was, was in the legal system already. No, it just amazed yeah. me that he said that, right? Yeah. And he said it was a stupid thing, and he said, yeah. he explained it to me, I never realized how fast. 
Yeah, so our fear is that, I mean, there are individuals who are in the legal system who are probably being monitored, right? Because there's a, a court order that says, you know, you're, you, you are subject to this kind of observation because of something you've done in the past. Um, so this was not something he had done in the past. Oh. This was just a oh. random act. Was this out of school, though? Was yeah. School? All right. Yeah. So the other thing that's happening in, in schools have gotten incredibly serious about all kinds of security. No, and I get that. Right. I understand. Yeah, so they I was just shocked. Yeah, so there, I went back to my old high school um, a couple of years ago, and you know it's in New Jersey, and no surprise, it looked the same, but it did not function the same, right? And the first thing you do is check in an office where there's quite serious security. Um, I'm sure they're monitoring the students' social media, you know, that takes place in and around the school because all the all the things you read about in the newspaper. So that's sort of the nature of that. Yeah, it's just. I think there are certain environments like schools where, where that kind of surveillance is happening just because of the bad stuff you read about in the papers. Yeah. So, yeah, um, you know, if you really want to go totally off the grid, totally off the grid, um, you know, I would not have a smartphone. Um, I don't know if you can still buy a flip phone or not, but maybe you can. I have one. <laughs> That's good. Um, I would, you know, not take advantage of things like Alexa and, and things like that. Um, cars, it's probably hard to get a car, a new car that's not smart anymore. <laughs> you might have to buy older used cars, not to get a car that has got some kind of intelligence built into it, tracking and other things. Um, you'll lose good features though if you do that because things like anti-lock braking works because there's a computer that knows how to control that brake because the computer's got a little AI in it, right? So you go back to a time when stuff won't work as well, it didn't work as well, it works better now. Right, so it really is a mixed bag. It's, it's a blessing and a curse. Yep. Yeah, based on all the information that's available on the internet, can can it determine um, between truth and lies on subjective questions? I wouldn't trust ChatGPT or any AI to, to do that. What I would trust it to do, maybe, is to give you information that would support a certain position that then you could go look at yourself and decide whether it was trustworthy or not. Um, remember that we saw <laughs> Chat GPT very confidently say that Lehigh is older than Lafayette. Oh. So it's like, you can't trust it. <laughs> um, but you could say show, and we also know that it makes up references like in, the, in those, that court filing when it made up precedent, past precedent cases that were never real cases. Um, it's written, you know, academic papers where it makes up references that, were, that do not exist. You know, as these two economists argued in their paper in 1993, you know, and no such paper ever existed. <laughs> so you've got to be careful about that. But if you can trace back to the original source, you can build up confidence. Do you think there's a future that that could happen um, between truth and lies? Well, that's what we're very concerned about now. If you see the quality of the images it can generate, um, I would be very suspicious of anything that is incendiary that shows someone doing something that I wouldn't believe that they would have done, like a, a public figure, right? Um, if there is something um, showing um, uh, Taylor Swift naked, it's like, okay, that's fake. I'm sure that's fake. All right. So you all have to have an expectation first, right? Are there laws to protect people from those type of things? Yeah, right now, right now, so the legal system in Congress has worked very slowly, and, is, and this stuff is going really fast. So the laws that we have now, we've got some general laws to protect people from all kinds of bad behavior. You know, the laws that were written, you know, the Constitution and those laws, you know, brilliant sort of looking into the future. We have those kinds of laws. But some of the specific things that AI can do now are not yet legislated on because it takes Congress so long to make decisions in the past law. And the legal system is behind the times. Right? So I talk about copyright. Um, right now, it's not clear, like if, if ChatGPT were to read all the literature, right, and then produce a great novel, how would you know the authors of that literature benefit from that? what ChatGPT learned to write that great novel, right? Is, is that allowed or is that violating some kind of copyright? Mm. So that's not yet been decided. The Copyright Office doesn't know how to handle that. Um, you can imagine when AI starts producing better songs than any songwriter can produce, 
better stories, better movie scripts, better poems than any human can produce, better, better photographs than any human can produce. It's very close to that. So, you know, what happens to the, all of those professions, all of those, all of the richness that we get from that? Um, so, and again, there are no laws that, that make that illegal at this point, right? So, we don't, I don't think we know what's going to happen. Loneliness is a big problem in our country. Um, how close are we to having companion yeah. type robots? Yeah. Um, in terms of you know the text or voice chat, that that's doable now, right? Um, so I would say there was a movie called Her a few years ago where yeah. someone fell in love with yeah, fell in love Siri, with, yeah. basically. Um, yeah. Um, I think that if, if it's that kind of interaction, it, it's probably happening right now. Okay. Uh, if it's a robot that moves around, now, they tend not to be human-looking robots because they're, they're kind of freaky when you're mentioning robots. But there are very cute little pets, you know, little stuffed animals okay. that you can interact with. And again, Japan tends to be leading the way in this regard. So um, I think you can get these things commercially. Um, they'll interact with you. They sort of are nice to hold. And you know, so they satisfy some of that. Some of that. They're not as good as a human. Or, or is there maybe some real answer? Yeah. Who, who has the leading edge on this technology now? I mean, which? Uh, like which company or which country? Well, you know, you, obviously the big players like Google, you know, and Microsoft are, are, are up there. Um, OpenAI kind of came out of the blue with this idea. A couple years ago, no one had heard about OpenAI, but not because of ChatGPT. Um, <laughs> there are companies that make the hardware that support this, so NVIDIA. <laughs> anyway, that's the company that makes the hardware chips that actually allow the AI to run pretty fast. They're in the news a lot. These companies go from being you know, really valuable companies to be like insanely valuable companies because of the potential of AI. Um, you know, it's hard for universities to compete, frankly. So, you know, universities do some things great, but we can't compete with Google and Microsoft. And, I mean, they've got massive resources, right? Um, countries like China and, and, and Russia um, are making huge investments in AI, right? So they're pouring a lot of their resources in there as well. Um, and you can see that. So at this point, um, Chinese researchers are publishing more papers that American researchers are on this topic because they get the encouragement, they get the support. It's a strategic. Is AI involved in the world of hacking? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so AI can write novels. AI can write screenplays. AI can write videos. AI can write computer code. So, what we teach our students to do, you know, this is how you write computer code. It's boring. You sit. You like to bug it. AI can do a lot of that job. <coughs> Automatically write computer code. So just like I said, I didn't say it. New York Times said, you know, give me an image of a video of woolly mammoths and snow. Um, I would say, please write me a program to do X, Y, and Z. <coughs> AI would automatically write that program. Now, <laughs> because of the potential for bugs, I should check it carefully because we see AI can make mistakes. So AI can write good programs, or I could say, write me a program that will break into Wells Fargo online you know, website, right? I don't know what AI would do. They're probably guardrails. So if I ask something so explicit as that, it would refuse to do it. But there are always ways around these guardrails, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's some way to get AI to write malicious software, right? So. Is AI working against us in slot machines? <laughs> well, again, that's a highly regulated it's highly regulated, right? So um, I, you know, <laughs> don't quote me on this, but um, there, and I should, we should also talk about voting machines, because that's, that's in another area of my expertise. <laughs> um, so highly regulated, and the slot machines are actually more carefully regulated, unfortunately, than voting machines, which is a concern. So there are, you know, agencies that will make sure that, the, that there's a chip in there, the chip has not been swapped, that it generates random numbers with a certain behavior. So if they say the payoff, you know, that, the, that every dollar put in, customers get 98 cents back, yeah. um, I'm pretty sure they test that. 
right? And the, there's a regulatory agency that will. They, they, they that don't will have check. an AI in there teasing you. I don't. I don't think so. They're probably worried about you. They're probably more worried about you using an AI <laughs> to make the slot machine. I was going to say somebody could be able to come up with something. Yes, that that seems like it could be possible. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back there. Go ahead. Okay. So within the past week, for the first time, when I googled something, Copilot came up. Yeah. And that's, yeah. I've never seen it before. What is I mean, that is, is it now that AI will identify itself? Copilot. All right, so Copilot should be Microsoft. Okay. Yeah, Co Copilot should be Microsoft Bing. And I mentioned um, writing code, right? So they originally developed Copilot. So Microsoft, they're all companies that are sort of acquiring knowledge off the internet. So there are websites where programmers would post their code and share code. So GitHub is a very famous website. So um, Copilot took advantage of the fact that there's hundreds of millions of lines of computer code, public out there, to do different things, and learned, the AI learned from that. So this is the AI that will generate computer code for if you say, please write me a program that will do X, Y, and Z. Copilot is the assistant that will do that, the AI assistant that will do that, that Microsoft developed, right? So it's, it's another one of those generative AIs. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of what you see on the internet is, whether it's history or current events, seems to be leaning left or right as far as political. Is AI political? Um, not, no, it's not inherently political. So AI is not inherently biased, it's not inherently political, it's not inherently anything. But it learns very well from what it reads, from the information that it consumes. So if we're political, if we're biased, if we're you know wrong, it will be wrong too because it's only learning from us. Well, who's to say if you're right or wrong? Well, that's the other thing, right? So um, it only learns from us. So if it does great things, it's because it's learned from us. If it does bad things, it's because it's learned from us. Right? Um, the trouble sometimes we worry about the feedback loops, right? So if the way I get paid is by having more people come to my website. This is what causes some of the problems. Um, you know, I want more people to come to my website because I get more money because I've got advertisers and I'll get a little bit more money every time someone comes to my website. So I'll build, I'll build an AI that learns how to get people to come to my website. Doesn't matter if it's true or if it's false, I just want people to come to my website. That's what causes a lot of the problems today, right? I just, I just want people to come to my website. I don't care if I'm saying two or false things. So let me, uh, oops, sorry. Let me. Uh, this is what the uh, I googled uh, 